In the last video, we have started our chapter on the longitudinal dynamics of a vehicle by looking at the engine and the brakes. In this video, we will turn to the rest of the powertrain, in particular, the dynamics of the wheels and the drivetrain. Let's begin with the clutch and the torque converter and then work our way along the drive shaft down to the wheels. So for cars with a manual transmission, the first element behind the engine is a clutch. A clutch is a mechanical device for engaging or disengaging power transmission between the engine and the rest of the drive shaft and ultimately the wheels. Its main purpose in vehicles is to bridge the so-called power gap that all combustion engines have. And what this power gap means is that the engine is not able to deliver arbitrarily low amounts of power to the wheels, but it has a certain power threshold below which it is not able to deliver any power at its output. The standard type of clutch used in cars is a friction clutch whose concept is illustrated in a little sketch down here on the right hand side. From the left, the clutch is operated with the engine torque and in red we see all parts that are connected to and rotate with the engine shaft. On the right we see the torque that's passed on to the rest of the drivetrain and in blue we see all parts that are connected to and rotate with the drive shaft. If the clutch is to be disengaged then a force shown in green here pulls that part of the engine shaft to the right so that there's little to no physical connection between the drive shaft and the engine shaft. If the clutch is to be engaged, then the disengagement force is removed and a spring up here pushes this part of the engine shaft against the drive shaft, thus creating a very strong pressure in these friction areas and thus a very strong friction moment between the engine shaft and the drive shaft. As a result, within a very short period of time, the drive shaft will rotate with the same speed as the engine shaft, and we say that the clutch is engaged. Cars with an automatic transmission instead of a manual transmission have a torque converter instead of a clutch. More specifically, a torque converter is a fluid coupling between the engine and the rest of the drivetrain. The main elements of the torque converter are the impeller, the stator and the turbine. The impeller is connected to the torque of the engine and the turbine is connected to the shaft of the drivetrain. Unlike in this illustrative figure, the two halves of the shell of the torque converter are really mounted together and there's a fluid flowing inside of this shell. Now if the engine starts to rotate, the fluid inside the impeller is accelerated by the blades shown in blue here and the fluid is pressed outwards in radial direction due to the centrifugal forces. The turbine which is sitting on the other side of the torque converter, also has blades, shown in blue here, and looks actually very similar to the impeller. If the fluid starts to flow, it will accelerate the turbine through its blades, and hence a torque is produced at the shaft of the drivetrain. The fluid then flows back through the stator into the impeller, forming a circular flow. Now let's look a little more closely at the characteristic behavior of a torque converter. To this end, we draw a little diagram where we have the speed ratio 
between the rotational speed of the shaft and the rotational speed of the engine on the x-axis and it varies from 0% where basically the shaft is at rest and the engine is rotating to 100% where both shaft and engine are rotating with the same speed. We first look at the torque ratio, meaning the torque of the shaft divided by the torque applied by the engine. As we can see from this diagram, at a speed ratio of 100%, the torque ratio is approximately equal to 1, and that makes sense from the standpoint of a power consideration, because torque times speed should remain constant if we assume 100% energy efficiency of the torque converter. It is a rather helpful property of the torque converter that as the speed ratio drops to zero, the torque ratio increases to a factor between two and three for modern torque converters. This means that as the car is accelerated from a standstill, the torque of the engine is multiplied by a factor between two and three initially, and then still by a factor greater than one, decreasing to one as the speed of the car increases. So what about the power efficiency of a torque converter? The power efficiency is sketched in orange on the right hand axis here. It first increases steeply with the speed ratio and reaches a maximum close to a 100% speed ratio. The maximum power efficiency can reach values up to 98% for modern torque converters. To improve the power efficiency even further, most torque converters have what's called a lockup clutch that sets in at high speed ratios. The principle of the lockup clutch is similar to the friction clutch, and what it does is it locks the engine shaft with the impeller together with the drivetrain shaft with the turbine, and hence the power efficiency is increased to almost 100%. However, the main purpose of the torque converter is of course bridging the power gap of the engine. This means that at a standstill of the car, the turbine can be at rest while the impeller is still rotating with the minimum speed of the engine so that the engine doesn't stall. Notice, however, that if the impeller rotates and the turbine is at rest, there's still a small amount of torque transferred from the engine to the drivetrain shaft. And that's the reason why for cars with an automatic transmission, the driver has to apply a little bit of pressure to the brake pedal in order for the car to remain at standstill. As the next element of the drivetrain, let's look at the transmission. First of all, what is the purpose of a transmission? The transmission is needed because combustion engines operate most efficiently at different speeds and torques from what is actually needed at the wheels of the vehicle. In fact, the rotational speed of the engine is much faster than the rotational speed of the wheels, and consequently, the torque produced by the engine is much smaller than the torque that's needed at the wheels. Accordingly, one main purpose of the drivetrain is to provide a transformation of power between the engine with high speed and low torque and the wheels with low speed and high torque. The total transformation of power is a combination of the effects mainly of the transmission and the differential. Even though, as we have just seen, the clutch and the torque converter may also contribute a little bit to this power transformation. Remember, however, that their main purpose is to bridge the power gap of the engine. For the following analysis, we consider the power transformation between the output of the clutch or torque converter, which we have called omega shaft and M shaft, and the wheels, which we have called omega wheel and M wheel. If for the moment we assume 100% efficiency of the transmission, we would have that 
the speed times the torque at the shaft equals to the speed times the torque at the wheel. We define the gear ratio of the transmission as the ratio between the speed of the wheel and the speed of the shaft. And we'll use the letter capital R to denote the gear ratio. If we again assume 100% efficiency of the transmission, it is easy to use the above formula to show that the gear ratio is equal to the torque of the shaft divided by the torque at the wheel. In reality, of course, the efficiency of a transmission that we will call by eta is less than one. And in this case, the ratio between the output torque and the input torque is actually less than what it should be in the ideal case, in a way that the ratio of the speeds get, gets multiplied with the efficiency factor eta. So in effect, the output torque of a real transmission is less than the output torque that we would get for an ideal transmission. So just to give you an idea, real transmissions in passenger vehicles usually have an efficiency above 90%. And that includes a combination of the gearbox and the differential. Now the gear ratio in passenger vehicles is usually strictly less than one. It increases as the gear of the vehicle is shifted up. So from gear one to gear two to gear three and so on. The way that the gear ratios are chosen for each gear of the vehicle is usually close to a geometric progression. What this means algebraically is that the fraction between the gear ratio of two successive gears is constant, meaning that the gear ratio of the second gear divided by the gear ratio of the first gear is the same as the gear ratio of the third gear divided by the gear ratio of the second gear and so on. We can also illustrate this graphically by plotting the engine speed over the resulting wheel speed for the different gears. Of course, for each gear, the relationship between the engine speed and the wheel speed is just represented by a line whose slope is determined by the gear ratio of the respective gear. Now, the geometric progression implies that the engine can be operated within a desired operating range over a large region of the wheel speeds. So basically, as the vehicle is accelerated, at the end of this desired operating range, we shift into the second gear, and then we are back at the beginning of the desired operating range. Then we accelerate further up to the end of the operating range, then we shift to gear three. In gear three, we are again at the beginning of this operating range, accelerating further up to the end of the operating range and so on. In line with the performance criteria that we discussed when we talked about the engine, the desired operating range is selected in order to minimize in particular fuel consumption and also to some extent to minimize the emissions of the vehicle. Thus, in practice, the geometric progression is varied a little bit in order to optimize the engine performance at particular speeds, in particular the highway speed. So it's actually not exactly a geometric progression, but just close to a geometric progression. Another thing to keep in mind is that the optimal operating point of the engine does not just depend on the speed of the vehicle, but it also depends on the desired torque that is requested of the engine. The final element of the drivetrain that we would like to discuss here is the differential. In summary, a differential serves three purposes. First, distribution of the engine power to the wheels, meaning that it shares the engine power between the two wheels and also it redirects the power flow by 90 degrees. Second, it allows the wheels to turn at different speeds, which is particularly important when going around a curve where the outer wheel of the curve has to turn faster than the inner wheel. And third, 
the differential adds to the overall gear ratio of the transmission, or more precisely, the gear ratio of the differential multiplies the gear ratio of the gearbox. To understand the working principle of a differential, let's look at this schematic image on the right hand side. From this image, we see that the differential has three external connections. One is the transmission shaft, which provides the torque from the engine. And the other one are two half shafts, which are connected to the right wheel and the left wheel, respectively. To understand the functioning of the differential, let's first consider the scenario where both half shafts rotate at the same speed. Now suppose a propulsive torque is delivered from the engine to the differential via the transmission shaft. It drives the driving pinion and this pinion drives a ring gear, which itself is not connected to either of the half shafts. However, it is connected via these two blocks here to the two spider gears. Now, unless the two half shafts rotate relative to each other, the spider gears do not rotate themselves, so they only move along with the ring gear around the ring gear axis and via two side gears, which are rigidly connected to the corresponding half shaft, the entire ring gear together with the spider gears drives the two half shafts. So this is how the power of the engine gets transmitted via the driving pinion and the ring gear to the two half shafts. On top of that, as mentioned before, the differential allows for a difference in the rotation speed between the right and the left half shaft. The way this works is as follows. Observe that on top of the two half shafts rotating in synchrony, as just described, there's also the possibility for the two half shafts to rotate against each other. So for example, if the left half shaft rotates to the right here, this may cause the spider gears to rotate around their axis accordingly, and hence the right half shaft will rotate to the left. Hence, with the differential, the left and the right wheel can rotate freely in opposite directions in the ideal case, meaning without friction, etc. And as a consequence, the differential distributes the engine torque evenly between the left and the right wheel, independent of their rotation speed. While this property of even torque distribution is usually desirable, under normal driving conditions, so for instance when the car is driving a curve, it can become problematic if one of the wheels loses traction, so for example when the car is driving on uneven terrain. So imagine a situation where one wheel still has traction with the road and the other wheel is up in the air and now the torque of the engine is distributed evenly to both wheels, this means that the wheel that's up in the air will rotate very fastly because it's accelerated by the same torque as the wheel that still has traction, but unlike that one, the wheel that's up in the air has no resistive forces from the road anymore. For this reason, some vehicles, especially if they're meant for off-road driving, feature a differential lock that can be activated, and if it's activated, it blocks the opposite rotation mode of the two wheels and hence the two half shafts are effectively turned into one rigid shaft that can only rotate with a common speed.